Welcome back everybody. This video we're going to be talking a little bit more about how to get user input. In the previous examples all we did was get string input but now I want to talk about how to get input of these various types. So this video is sponsored by Pramp. And if you don't know, Pramp is a peer-to-peer -peer interviewing platform where you can practice your technical interviews as well as your behavioral interviews. Pramp is a great resource for developers like you if you're hoping to get a job in the industry or if you're just hoping to solidify your interview skills. Pramp is the way to go. So check them out, guys. I'll leave a link for you guys in the description. They're super awesome. You definitely want to check them out. All right, so the previous video, we talked about all these primitive values. And I'm going to get rid of this just so we can have a clean slate. Now, if you guys remember how to get user input, what you need to do is you need to create a scanner and then you can name it whatever you want. I'm going to name it scanner with a lowercase s and set that equal to a new scanner, which we'll call the scanner constructor and give us a new scanner object. Inside of the parentheses, you need to pass system.in. Now, to get a new line, all we have to do is say scanner dot and then next and there's all kinds of different options in here the one we did originally was next line this will return a string so when you press the dot and then type out the function name or the method name by the way function and method are basically the same thing just the only difference is a method is attached to an object and since we're in an object oriented programming language these are technically called methods but enough of that if you look at this you can see a little bit more about what the method does this one's not super clear what's going on, but basically this is going to get us a string. If you look at a different one, such as next int, it's a little bit more clear. The int scanned from the input. So let's start with next line and just see how that works. So what this is going to do is it's going to get a line and return it. And what that means is it's going to give us back an output. And we need to do something with that output. So typically we're going to store that in a variable. So we could say string x equals now we can output that with system.out.println. And it really super bothers me that this one's print line with like a lowercase ln, and this one's line with a capital L <laughs> in the full word. But what are you gonna do? We can pass x into here, and now let's run it. And then it'll expect an input, and then it will output what we just put in. All right, so that's how you do it with strings. Now let's try some other data. Let's say int y equals next int. Let's run that. And then what we can do is we can output that as well. And then my age is 5, it prints 5. The cool thing here is that this is typed as an integer, typed as in data type, not like typing on a keyboard. <laughs> and what that means is we can use that inside of an expression. So I could say in a equals y plus 10, for example. And we're going to talk a bit more about mathematical expressions, but for now, let's just go with this. And I'm going to comment out this one so it doesn't keep asking me for input. All right, so now we can just pass in 20 and we need to uh, print the new variable a. All right, so we pass in 20 and it prints the original one. Then it adds y and 10 and assigns that to a. So now a contains 30 and it prints 30. Cool. Now, if you wanna get any of the other data types, there are different methods for that. So let's go scanner.next, and now let's just look at some of these. So one of these is next big decimal and next big integer. These are two data types we never talked about because they're actually classes, and we've only really dived into primitive types. But if you guys remember the float and double data types, they allow decimal values. Well, this big decimal also allows decimal values. So you could store something like 10.1. But the difference between big decimal and float and double is that big decimal is trustworthy when it comes to precision. So float and double are known as floating point numbers, and this is a fixed point number. So if you're intending on working with something like money where you need it to be exact, you're definitely going to want to use a big decimal. And that would look something like this. So you could say big decimal, and we can say money instead of, oops. <laughs> money instead equal to scanner.next big decimal. This method here is going to return a big decimal, so we need to store it inside of a big decimal, which requires us to import this right here, java.math.bigdecimal. So that's how you could get a big decimal from the user. There was also one for big integer, which is slightly different than a normal integer. So if that's something you guys wanna learn more about, you can research that. Anyways, let's look at some of the other ones. So next Boolean, that can be used to get a boolean value 
and it says here that it'll throw an exception, which is just an error, if it cannot be translated into a valid Boolean value. So let's try it. And I'm gonna get rid of all this stuff here. And we're going to store this in a Boolean variable, like this. And then we're gonna output it too. Let's put the value true, and it works. We put the value false, and it works. We put something like 27, it gets an error. So basically it threw an exception, meaning that our program was not able to execute because there's an input mismatch. All right, let's see what else there is. And then there's this next byte with a radix. So what that is, is the base of the number. So we count in base 10, but if you're looking to use hexadecimal or octal, for example, you could check that out. There's also one for the next integer with the radix and next long. So if you're working with larger hexadecimal, octal, or even binary or whatever the base is, if you're working with those, you wanna use one of these with this radix here. So let's just try this out. Let's say we wanna get an integer using this radix, and let's say we want to pass in eight. And then let's store this back in an integer. We'll just call it x, and we'll system out this x. Okay, and now let's run this. So let's just put in the value one zero. And this input is an octal, base eight. And what that means is this is going to be interpreted as eight in decimal, so when we output it, it's outputting in decimal, we get the value eight. If that makes no sense to you guys, that's fine because we didn't really talk about it much. You can definitely go check out my videos on octal, hexadecimal, and binary, which will clear all that up for you. But most of the time, you're not gonna need that. You're just gonna be using the one with no arguments. And now it'll work like decimal. <laughs> so I put in 10, it gives us 10. And then of course, there's ones for double and flow and long and short and all, all the different variations. So that covers how to get input of different types. Another thing you may wanna know is just about casting. We talked a little bit about this. So for example, we might be getting an integer, but then we might cast that by storing it into a double. In this situation, it's automatically behind the scenes or implicitly converted to a double. But in some scenarios, let's say we got next double and we're storing that in an integer, we might need to cast that manually by like the, by using this parentheses int. So in this situation, if we run this and we put in the value 30.5 or even 30.9, it should just print 30. And there you go, you get 30. So that's how to get input of different types. Hopefully that was helpful for you guys. Please be sure to subscribe if you've enjoyed this series. Definitely helpful to me and be sure to check out the description for some good links for you guys. Thanks guys, I'll see you in the next one.